You fool! Warren is dead. Welcome once again to Horror Babble. Today we've got a fabulous little curiosity in store for you. The Horror in the Lighthouse, also known as simply The Lighthouse, is a finished version of Edgar Allan Poe's last work, The Lighthouse. Robert Block, who quite literally picked up where Poe left off, completed the story and saw it published in the magazine Fantastic in 1953. The 2019 movie, The Lighthouse, began as an attempt to adapt Poe's fragment. We hope you enjoy this one, folks. The Horror in the Lighthouse by Edgar Allan Poe and Robert Block January 1st, 1796 This day, my first on the lighthouse, I make this entry in my diary, as agreed on with de Grat. As regularly as I can keep the journal, I will. But there is no telling what may happen to a man all alone as I am. I may get sick or worse. So far well. The cutter had a narrow escape, but why dwell on that, since I am here, all safe? My spirits are beginning to revive already, at the mere thought of being, for once in my life at least, thoroughly alone. For, of course, Neptune, large as he is, is not to be taken into consideration as society. Would to heaven I had ever found in society one half as much faith as in this poor dog. In such case I and society might never have parted, even for a year. What most surprises me is the difficulty de Grat had in getting me the appointment, and I a noble of the realm. It could not be that the consistory had any doubt of my ability to manage the light. One man has attended it before now, and got on quite as well as the three that are usually put in. The duty is a mere nothing, and the printed instructions are as plain as possible. It would never have done to let Orndorff accompany me. I should never have made any way with my book as long as he was within reach of me, with his intolerable gossip, not to mention that everlasting meerschaum. Besides, I wish to be alone. It is strange that I never observed until this moment how dreary a sound that word has, alone. I could half fancy there was some peculiarity in the echo of these cylindrical walls, but, oh no, that is all nonsense. I do believe I am going to get nervous about my insulation. That will never do. I have not forgotten de Grat's prophecy. Now for a scramble to the lantern and a good look around to see what I can see. To see what I can see, indeed, not very much. The swell is subsiding a little, I think, but the cutter will have a rough passage home, nevertheless. She will hardly get within sight of the Norlon before noon to-morrow and yet it can hardly be more than a hundred and ninety or two hundred miles. January 2nd I have passed this day in a species of ecstasy that I find it impossible to describe. My passion for solitude could scarcely have been more thoroughly gratified. I do not say satisfied, for I believe I should never be satiated with such delight as I have experienced to-day. The wind lulled after daybreak, and by the afternoon the sea had gone down materially. Nothing to be seen with the telescope even but ocean and sky, with an occasional gull. January 3rd A dead calm all day. Towards evening the sea looked very much like glass. A few seaweeds came in sight, but besides them absolutely nothing all day, not even the slightest speck of cloud. Occupied myself in exploring the lighthouse. It is a very lofty one, as I find to my cost when I have to ascend its interminable stairs, not quite a hundred and sixty feet, I should say, from the low water mark to the top of the lantern. From the bottom inside the shaft, however, the distance to the summit is a hundred and eighty feet at least, thus the floor is twenty feet below the surface of the sea, even at low tide. It seems to me that the hollow interior at the bottom should have been filled in with solid masonry. Undoubtedly the hole would have been thus rendered more safe, 
But what am I thinking about? A structure such as this is safe enough under any circumstances. I should feel myself secure in it during the fiercest hurricane that ever raged. And yet I have heard seamen say that, occasionally, with a wind at south-west, the sea has been known to run higher here than anywhere, with the single exception of the western opening of the Straits of Magellan. No mere sea, though, could accomplish anything with this solid iron-riveted wall, which, at fifty feet from high water mark, is four feet thick, if one inch. The basis on which the structure rests seems to me to be chalk. January 4th I am now prepared to resume work on my book, having spent this day in familiarizing myself with a regular routine. My actual duties will be, I perceive, absurdly simple. The light requires little tending beyond a periodic replenishment of the oil for the six-wick burner. As to my own needs, they are easily satisfied, and the exertion of an occasional trip down the stairs is all I must anticipate. At the base of the stairs is the entrance room. Beneath that is twenty feet of empty shaft. Above the entrance room, at the next turn of the circular iron staircase, is my storeroom, which contains the casks of fresh water and the food supplies, plus linens and other daily needs. Above that, again, another spiral of those interminable stairs is the oil room, completely filled with the tanks from which I must feed the wicks. Fortunately, I perceive that I can limit my descent to the storeroom to once a week if I choose, for it is possible for me to carry sufficient provisions in one load to supply both myself and Neptune for such a period. As to the oil supply, I need only to bring up two drums every three days, and thus ensure a constant illumination. If I choose, I can place a dozen or more spare drums on the platform near the light, and thus provide for several weeks to come. So it is that in my daily existence I can limit my movements to the upper half of the lighthouse, that is to say, the three spirals opening on the topmost three levels. The lowest is my living room, and it is here, of course, that Neptune is confined the greater part of the day, here too that I plan to write at a desk near the wall slit that affords a view of the sea without. The second highest level is my bedroom and kitchen combined. Here the weekly rations of food and water are contained in cupboards for that purpose. Here too is the ingenious stove fed by the self-same oil that lights the beacon above. In the topmost level is the service room, giving access to the light itself and to the platform surrounding it. Since the light is fixed and its reflectors set, there is no need for me ever to ascend to the platform save when replenishing the oil supply or making a repair or adjustment as per the written instructions, a circumstance which may well never arise during my stay here. Already I have carried enough oil, water, and provender to the upper levels to last me for an entire month. I need stir from my two rooms only to replenish the wicks. For the rest I am free, utterly free. My time is my own, and in this lofty realm I rule as king— Although Neptune is my only living subject, I can well imagine that I am sovereign over all I see, ocean below and stars above. I am master of the sun that rises in rubicund radiance from the sea at dawn, emperor of wind and monarch of the gale, sultan of the waves that sport or roar in roiling torrents about the base of my palace pinnacle. I command the moon in the heavens, and the very ebb and flow of the tide does homage to my reign. But enough of fancies. De Grat warned me to refrain from morbid or from grandiose speculation. Now I shall take up in all earnestness the task that lies before me. Yet this night, as I sit before the window in the starlight, the tide sweeping against these lofty walls can only echo my exultation. I am free, and at last, alone. January 11th a week has passed since my last entry in this diary, and as I read it over I can scarce comprehend that it was I who penned those words. Something has happened, the nature of which lies unfathomed. I have worked, eaten, slept, replenished the wicks twice. My outward existence has been placid. I can ascribe the alteration in my feelings to naught but some inner alchemy, 
enough to say that a disturbing change has taken place. Alone, I, who breathe the word as if it were some mystic incantation bestowing peace, have come, I realize it now, to loathe the very sound of the syllables, and the ghastliness of meaning I know full well. It is a dismaying, it is a dreadful thing to be alone, truly alone as I am, with only Neptune to exist beside me, and by his breathing presence remind me that I am not the sole inhabitant of a blind and senseless universe. The sun and stars that wheel overhead in their endless cycle seem to rush across the horizon unheeding, and of late unheeded, for I cannot fix my mind upon them with normal constancy. The sea that swirls or ripples below me is naught but a purposeless chaos of utter emptiness. I thought myself to be a man of singular self-sufficiency, beyond the petty needs of a boring and banal society. How wrong I was, for I find myself longing for the sight of another face, the sound of another voice, the touch of other hands, whether they offer caresses or blows, anything, anything for reassurement that my dreams are indeed false, and that I am not actually alone. And yet I am. I am, and I will be. The world is two hundred miles away. I will not know it again for an entire year, and it in turn, but no more. I cannot put down my thoughts while in the grip of this morbid mood. January 13th Two more days, two more centuries have passed. Can it be less than two weeks since I was immured in this prison tower? I mount the turret of my dungeon and gaze at the horizon. I am not hemmed in by bars of steel, but by columns and pillars and webs of wild and raging water. The sea has changed. Grey skies have wrought a wizardry, so that I stand surrounded by a tumult that threatens to become a tempest. I turn away, for I can bear no more and descend to my room. I seek to write. The book is bravely begun, but of late I can bring myself to do nothing constructive or creative, and in a moment I fling aside my pen and rise to pace, to endlessly pace the narrow, circular confines of my tower of torment. Wild words, these, and yet I am not alone in my affliction. Neptune, Neptune the loyal, the calm, the placid, feels it too. Perhaps it is but the approach of the storm that agitates him so, for nature bears closer kinship with the beast. He stays constantly at my side, whining now, and the muffled roaring of the waves without our prison causes him to tremble. There is a chill in the air that our stove cannot dissipate, but it is not cold that oppresses him. I have just mounted to the platform, and gazed out at the spectacle of gathering storm. The waves are fantastically high. They sweep against the lighthouse in titanic tumult. These solid walls of stone shudder rhythmically with each onslaught. The churning sea is grey no longer. The water is black, black as basalt and as heavy. The sky's hue has deepened, so that at the moment no horizon is visible. I am surrounded by a billowing blackness thundering against me. Back below now, as lightning flickers. The storm will break soon, and Neptune howls piteously. I stroke his quivering flanks, but the poor animal shrinks away. It seems that he fears even my presence. Can it be that my own features betray an equal agitation? I do not know. I only feel that I am helpless, trapped here and awaiting the mercy of the storm. I cannot write much longer." and yet I will set down a further statement. I must, if only to prove to myself that reason again prevails. In writing of my venture up to the platform, my viewing of the sea and sky, I omitted to mention the meaning of a single moment. There came upon me, as I gazed down at the black and boiling madness of the waters below, a wild and willful craving to become one with it. But why should I disguise the naked truth? 
I felt an insane impulse to hurl myself into the sea. It has passed now. Passed, I pray, forever. I did not yield to this perverse prompting, and I am back here in my quarters, writing calmly once again. Yet the fact remains. The hideous urge to destroy myself came suddenly, and with the force of one of those monstrous waves. And what, I forced myself to realize, was the meaning of my demented desire. It was that I sought escape, escape from loneliness. It was as if by mingling with the sea and the storm, I would no longer be alone. But I defy the elements, I defy the powers of the earth and of the heavens. Alone I am, alone I must be. And, come what may, I shall survive. My laughter rises above all your thunder. So, ye spirits of the storm, blow, howl, rage, hurl your watery weight against my fortress. I am greater than you in all your powers. But wait! Neptune, something has happened to the creature. I must attend him. January 16th The storm is abated. I am back at my desk now, alone, truly alone. I have locked poor Neptune in the storeroom below. The unfortunate beast seems driven out of his wits by the forces of the storm. When last I wrote, he was worked into a frenzy, whining and pawing and wheeling in circles. He was incapable of responding to my commands, and I had no choice but to literally drag him down the stairs by the scruff of his neck and incarcerate him in the storeroom, where he could not come to harm. I own that concern for my safety was involved. The possibility of being imprisoned in this lighthouse with a mad dog must be avoided. His howls throughout the storm were pitiable indeed, but now he is silent. When last I ventured to gaze into the room, I perceived him sleeping, and I trust that rest and calm will restore him to my full companionship, as before. Companionship! How shall I describe the horrors of the storm I faced alone? In this diary entry I have prefaced a date, January 16th, but that is merely a guess. The storm has swept away all track of time. Did it last a day, two days, three, as I now surmise, a week, or a century? I, I do not know. I know only an endless raging of waters that threatened time and again to engulf the very pinnacle of the lighthouse. I know only an eternity of ebony, an eon of billowing black composed of sea and sky commingled. I only know that there were times when my own voice outroared the storm, but how can I convey the cause of that? There was a time, perhaps, a full day, perhaps much longer, when I could not bear to rise from my couch, but lay with my face buried in the pillows, weeping like a child. But mine were not the pure tears of childhood innocence. Call them, rather, the tears of Lucifer upon the realization of his eternal fall from grace. It seemed to me that I was truly the victim of an endless damnation, condemned forever to remain a prisoner in a world of thunderous chaos. There is no need to write of the fancies and fantasies which assailed me through those unhallowed hours. At times I felt that the lighthouse was giving way, and that I would be swept into the sea. At times I knew myself to be a victim of a colossal plot. I cursed de Grat for sending me, knowingly, to my doom. At times, and these were the worst moments of all, I felt the full force of loneliness crashing down upon me in waves higher than those wrought by water. But all has passed, and the sea and myself are calm again. A peculiar calmness, this. As I gaze out upon the water, there are certain phenomena I was not aware of until this very moment. Before setting down my observations, let me reassure myself that I am indeed quite calm. No trace of my former tremors or agitation yet remains. The transient madness induced by the storm has departed, and my brain is free of phantasms. Indeed, my perceptive faculties seem to be sharpened to an unusual acuity. 
It is almost as though I find myself in possession of an additional sense, an ability to analyse and penetrate beyond former limitations superimposed by nature. The water on which I gaze is placid once more. The sky is only lightly leaden in hue. But wait! Though on the horizon creeps a sudden flame, it is the sun, the arctic sun, in sullen splendour, emerging momentarily from the pole to incarnadine the ocean. Sun and sky, sea and air about me, turn to blood. Can it be I, who but a moment ago wrote of returned, regained sanity, I, who have just shrieked aloud, alone, and half rising from my chair, heard the muffled booming echo reverberate through the lonely lighthouse, its sepulchral accent intoning alone, in answer? It may be that I am, despite all resolution, going mad. If so, I pray the end comes soon. January 18th. There will be no end. I have conceived a notion, a theory which my heightened faculty soon will test. I shall embark upon an experiment. January 26th. A week has passed here in my solitary prison. Solitary? <laughs> Perhaps, but not for long. The experiment is proceeding. I must set down what has occurred. The sound of the echo set me to thinking. One sends out one's voice, and it comes back. One sends out one's thoughts, and can it be that there is a response? Sound, as we know, travels in waves and patterns. The emanations of the brain, perhaps, travel similarly, and they are not confined by physical laws of time, space, or duration. Can one's thoughts produce a reply that materialises, just as one's voice produces an echo? An echo is a product of a certain vacuum, a thought. Concentration is the key. I have been concentrating. My supplies are replenished, and Neptune, visited during my venture below, seems rational enough, although he shrinks away when I approach him. I have left him below and spent the past week here. Concentration, I repeat is the key to my experiment. Concentration, by its very nature, is a difficult task. I addressed myself to it with no little trepidation. Strive but to remain seated quietly, with a mind empty of all thought, and one finds in the space of a very few minutes that the errant body is engaged in all manner of distracting movement, foot-tapping, finger-twisting, facial grimacing. This I managed to overcome after a matter of many hours. My first three days were virtually exhausted in an effort to rid myself of nervous agitation and assume the inner and outer tranquillity of the Indian fakir. Then came the task of filling the empty consciousness, filling it completely with one intense and concentrated effort of will. What echo would I bring forth from nothingness? What companionship would I seek here in my loneliness? What was the sign or symbol I desired? What symbolized to me the whole absent world of life and light? Dick Rat would laugh me to scorn if he but knew the concept that I chose. Yet I, the cynical, the jaded, the decadent, searched my soul, plumbed my longing, and found that which I most desired. A simple sign a token of all the earth removed, a fresh and growing flower, a rose. Yes, a simple rose is what I have sought, a rose torn from its living stem, perfumed with the sweet incarnation of life itself. Seated here before the window, I have dreamed, I have mused, I have then concentrated with every fibre of my being upon a rose. My mind was filled with redness, not the redness of the sun upon the sea, or the redness of blood, but the rich and radiant redness of the rose. My soul was suffused with the scent of a rose, as I brought my faculties to bear exclusively upon the image. These walls fell away, the walls of my very flesh fell away, and I seemed to merge in the texture, the odour, the colour the actual essence of a rose. Shall I write of this, on the seventh day, when, seated at the window as the sun emerged from the sea, I 
felt the commanding of my consciousness? Shall I write of rising, descending the stairs, opening the iron door at the base of the lighthouse, and peering out at the billows that swirled at my very feet? Shall I write of stooping, of grasping, of holding? Shall I write that I have indeed descended those iron stairs, and returned here with my wave-borne trophy, that this very day, from waters two hundred miles distant from any shore, I have reached down and plucked a fresh rose? January 28th It has not withered. I keep it before me constantly in a vase on this table, and it is a priceless ruby plucked from dreams. It is real, as real as the howls of poor Neptune, who senses that something odd is afoot. His frantic barking does not disturb me. Nothing disturbs me, for I am master of a power greater than earth or space or time, and I shall use this power now to bring me the final boon. Here in my tower I have become quite the philosopher. I have learned my lesson well, and realized that I do not desire wealth or fame or the trinkets of society. My need is simply this, companionship, and now, with the power that is mine to control, I shall have it. Soon, quite soon, I shall no longer be alone. January 30th The storm has returned, but I pay it no heed, nor do I mark the howlings of Neptune, although the beast is now literally dashing himself against the door of the storeroom. One might fancy that his efforts are responsible for the shuddering of the very lighthouse itself, but no, it is the fury of the northern gale. I pay it no heed, as I say, but I fully realize that this storm surpasses in extent and intensity anything I could imagine as witness to its predecessor. Yet it is unimportant. Even though the light above me flickers and threatens to be extinguished by the sheer velocity of wind that seeps through these stout walls, even though the ocean sweeps against the foundations with a force that makes solid stone seem flimsy as straw, even though the sky is a single black, roaring mouth that yawns low upon the horizon to engulf me. These things I sense but dimly, as I address myself to the appointed task. I pause now only for food and a brief respite and scribble down these words to mark the progress of resolution towards an inevitable goal. For the past several days I have bent my faculties to my will, concentrating utterly and to the uttermost upon the summoning of a companion. This companion will be, I confess it, a woman, a woman far surpassing the limitations of common mortality, for she is and must be fashioned of dreams and longing of desire and delight beyond the bounds of flesh. She is the woman of whom I have always dreamed, the one I have sought in vain through what I once presumed in my ignorance was the world of reality. It seems to me now that I have always known her, that my soul has contained her presence forever. I can visualize her perfectly. I know her hair, each strand more precious than a miser's gold, the riches of her ivory and alabaster brow, the perfection of her face and form, are etched forever in my consciousness. De Gret would scoff that she is but the figment of a dream, but de Gret did not see the rose. The rose, I hesitate to speak of it, has gone. It was the rose which I set before me when first I composed myself to this new effort of will. I gazed at it intently until vision faded, senses stilled, and I lost myself in the attempt of conjuring up my vision of a companion. Hours later, the sound of rising waters from without aroused me. I gazed about, my eyes sought the reassurance of the rose, and rested only upon a foulness. Where the rose had risen proudly in its vase, red crest rampant upon a living stem, I now perceived only a noxious, utterly detestable strand of icarus decay. No rose this, but only seaweed, rotted, noisome, 
putrescent. I flung it away, but for long moments I could not banish a wild presentiment. Was it true that I had deceived myself? Was it a weed, and only a weed I plucked from the ocean's breast? Did the force of my thought momentarily invest it with the attributes of a rose? Would anything I called up from the depths, the depths of sea, or the depths of consciousness, be truly real? The blessed image of the companion came to soothe these fevered speculations, and I knew myself saved. There was a rose. Perhaps my thought had created it and nourished it. Only when my entire concentration turned to other things did it depart, or resume another shape. And with my companion there will be no need for focusing my faculties elsewhere. She and she alone will be the recipient of everything my mind, my heart, my soul possesses. If will, if sentiment, if love are needed to preserve her, these things she shall have in entirety. So there is nothing to fear, nothing to fear. Once again now I shall lay my pen aside, and return to the great task, the task of creation, if you will, and I shall not fail. The fear, I admit it, of loneliness is enough to drive me forward to unimaginable brinks. She, and she alone, can save me, shall save me, must save me. I can see her now, the golden glitter of her, and my consciousness calls to her to rise, to appear before me in radiant reality. Somewhere upon these storm-tossed seas, she exists, I know it, and wherever she may be, my call will come to her, and she will respond. January 31st The command came at midnight, roused from the depths of the most profound innermost communion by a thunderclap. I rose as though in the grip of somnambulistic compulsion, and moved down the spiral stairs. The lantern I bore trembled in my hand, its light wavered in the wind, and the very iron treads beneath my feet shook with the furious force of the storm. The booming of the waves as they struck the lighthouse wall seemed to place me within the centre of a maelstrom of ear-shattering sound. Yet over the demoniacal din I could detect the frenzied howls of poor Neptune as I passed the door behind which he was confined. The door shook with the combined force of the wind, and of his still desperate efforts to free himself. But I hastened on my way, descending to the iron door at the base of the lighthouse. To open it required the use of both hands, and I set the lantern down at one side. To open it, moreover, required the summoning of a resolution I scarcely possessed, for beyond that door was the force and fury of the wildest storm that ever shrieked across these seething seas. A sudden wave might dash me from the doorway, or, conversely, enter and inundate the lighthouse itself. But consciousness prevailed, consciousness drove me forward. I knew, I thrilled to the certainty that she was without the iron portal. I unbolted the door with the urgency of one who rushes into the arms of his beloved. The door swung open, blew open, roared open and the storm burst upon me, a ravening monster of black-mouthed waves capped with white fangs. The sea and sky surged forward as if to attack, and I stood enveloped in chaos. A flash of lightning revealed the immensity of utter nightmare. I saw it not, for the same flash illumined the form, the lineaments of she whom I sought. Lightning and lantern were unneeded, her golden glory outshone all as she stood there, pale and trembling, a goddess arisen from the depths of the sea. Hallucination? Vision? Apparition? My trembling fingers sought and found their answer. Her flesh was real, cold as the icy waters from whence she came, but palpable and permanent. I thought of the storm— of doomed ships and drowning men, of a girl cast upon the waters, and struggling towards the succour of the lighthouse beacon. I thought of a thousand explanations, 
A thousand miracles, a thousand riddles, or reasons beyond rationality. Yet only one thing mattered. My companion was here. I had but to step forward and take her in my arms. No word was spoken, nor could one be heard in all that inferno. No word was needed, for she smiled. Pale lips parted as I held out my arms, and she moved closer. Pale lips parted, and I saw the pointed teeth set in rows like those of a shark. Her eyes, fish-like and staring, swam closer. As I recoiled, her arms came up to cling, and they were cold as the waters beneath, cold as the storm, cold as death. In one monstrous moment I knew— knew with uttermost certainty that the power of my will had indeed summoned, the call of my consciousness had been answered, but the answer came not from the living, for nothing lived in this storm. I had sent my will out over the waters, but the will penetrates all dimensions, and my answer had come from below the waters. She was from below, where the drowned dead lie dreaming and I had awakened her, and clothed her with a horrid life, a life that thirsted and must drink. I think I shrieked then, but I heard no sound. Certainly, I did not hear the howls from Neptune as the beast burst from his prison, bounded down the stairs, and flung himself upon the creature. His furry form bore her back and obscured my vision— in an instant she was falling backwards away into the sea that spawned her. Then, and only then, did I catch a glimpse of the final moment of animation in that which my consciousness had summoned. Lightning seared the sight inexorably upon my soul, the sight of the ultimate blasphemy I had created in my pride. The rose had wilted. The rose had wilted and become seaweed, and now— the golden one was gone, and in its place was the bloated, swollen obscenity of a thing long drowned and dead, risen from the slime, and to that slime returning. Only a moment, and then the waves overwhelmed it, bore it back into the blackness. Only a moment, and the door was slammed shut. Only a moment, and I raced up the iron stairs, Neptune yammering at my heels. Only a moment— and I reached the safety of this sanctuary. Safety? There is no safety in the universe for me, no safety in a consciousness that could create such horror, and there is no safety here. The wrath of the waves increases with every moment. The anger of the sea and its creatures rises to an inevitable crescendo. Mad or sane, it does not matter for the end is the same in either case. I know now that the lighthouse will shatter and fall. I am already shattered, and must fall with it. There is time only to gather these notes, strap them securely in a cylinder, and attach it to Neptune's collar. It may be that he can swim, or cling to a fragment of debris. It may be that a ship, passing by this toppling beacon, may stay and search the waters for a sign— and thus find and rescue the gallant beast. That ship shall not find me. I go with the lighthouse, and go willingly down to the dark depths. Perhaps is it but perverted poetry? I shall join my companion there forever. <laughs> Perhaps. The lighthouse is trembling. The beacon flickers above my head, and I hear the rush of waters in their final onslaught. There is, yes, a wave bearing down upon me. It is higher than the tower. It blots out the sky itself. Everything. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, 
See the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages, our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.